I've had people make this comment to me, and maybe you've made this comment. Well, I don't understand why a man couldn't just pay for his own sin. And what they're really doing is asking a question, and the question they're asking is this. What if a man did some kind of penance, couldn't God forgive him, and then give him eternal life? Well, the answer is, not legally. Remember what the word legally means. It means according to the law. You see, according to the law, there's only one way that a person can obtain eternal life. And that's by keeping the law perfectly. I need to add that little caveat because a person must keep the law perfectly. So even if you did pay for your sin, it still wouldn't erase the fact that you haven't kept the law. Not perfectly. You are a lawbreaker. Now, think about it. So what if you paid for your sin in a place like purgatory? Pur purgatory. So what? You, don't deserve, you deserve the punishment. But that doesn't mean that you deserve eternal life because you still haven't done what's necessary to earn eternal life. You have not kept the law perfectly. You see, God is just, which means he must punish sin and reward righteousness. So even if you were punished for your sin, you're still not righteous. Therefore, God cannot reward you with eternal life, not legally. And God being just cannot and will not violate the law. Think of it like this. Let's suppose that you committed a felony and you're convicted. And because you've committed a felony, you're sent to prison and you do your time. You do the crime, you do the time. So you've done the time. When you get out, are you rewarded? No. You've done nothing to deserve being rewarded. Well, I paid my time. Well, sure, because you're a felon. But here's the interesting thing. When you've served your time and you get out, you're still a felon. Now, I know there are going to be those that write me emails or send me a text Pastor, you just have no compassion. Let me stop you right there. I've got a family member that's been to prison three times. Three times. Did he deserve to go to prison? You betcha. Yes. And when he got out after serving his time, each time, we didn't reward him with a Wilkie button. Do you understand what I'm saying? And here's the interesting thing. When he got out, and to this day, he's still considered a felon, therefore he can't vote or own a handgun. You need to understand, even if you paid for your own sin, you would still be a lawbreaker after you paid for it. And because God is just, he can only reward righteousness, and you're not righteous. You're a lawbreaker. Is everyone with me? So from a legal standpoint, God couldn't raise you from the dead, even if you went to a place like purgatory and you paid for your sin. After it was all over and done, you still wouldn't be righteous because you haven't kept the law. So God could not legally give you eternal life, even if he wanted to, because you're not righteous. Therefore, you don't deserve it. You're still considered to be a lawbreaker, just like a felon is still considered to be a felon after he's paid for his crime. So, God couldn't legally give you eternal life, even if he wanted to. But people, that's why Jesus came. Jesus came to do what we couldn't do for ourselves. You see, Jesus came to do two things. Number one, he came, came to pay the penalty for your sin. And number two, he came to make you righteous so that God could legally give you eternal life according to the law. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 21, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. For he, who is he? God. For God hath made him. Who is him? Jesus. For God hath made Jesus to be sin for us who knew no sin. Jesus never sinned. So God made him, Jesus, sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. Now catch this part, because we are not the righteous God apart from him. 
so that we might become the righteous of God in Him. But this brings up an interesting theological question. If Jesus was made to be sin, how did he remain sinless? In other words, how could Jesus be made our sin and still remain sinless at the same time? Because if that's not possible, it means that once Jesus becomes our sin, then he's in the same boat that we are. He's up the creek without a paddle. God wouldn't be able to legally raise him from the dead. And people, that question has plagued theologians for centuries. But what if I told you that I could prove that Jesus never sinned, even when he was made our sin? What if I could prove that it was possible for Jesus to be made sin and still remain sinless at the same time? Because that's what I intend to do this morning. I intend to prove to you that Jesus was actually fulfilling the law. Jesus was actually keeping the law when he was made sin for us. And that, in other words, he actually fulfilled all righteousness by being made our sin. In fact, he never sinned even when he was made our sin. Therefore, God could legally raise him from the dead. And that's exactly what I'm going to prove to you this morning. So turn with me, if you would, to the book of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 36 through 40, and follow along as I read this passage of Scripture. It's a wonderful passage of Scripture. Now, the person who inspired this, he was a lawyer. He knew the word. And he wasn't asking this with the right motive. He wanted to trap Jesus. So he thought he could ask Jesus a question that would stump him. So, this is what he asked. He said, Master, being facetious, sarcastic, which is the great commandment in the law? And that's really a bad translation because the word great is a comparative term. It should have been translated, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And that's what he wanted to know. What is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like unto it. In other words, Boy, if I was going to put another one up there that's almost equal to it, in fact, it just about might be equal to it, it's this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now notice this. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, this passage states the two greatest commandments in the law are to number one, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And number two, to love your neighbor as yourself. Then Jesus said something very interesting in verse 40, and I called your attention to it. What is it? Jesus said, on these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. In other words, every law and everything that was taught by the prophets can be categorized under one of two categories. They either fall under loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, or they fall under the category of loving your neighbor as yourself. Every law can be categorized under one of those two things. Every teaching of the prophets can be categorized under one of those two categories, either under loving God or loving your neighbor. So in essence, these two commandments contain all of the law in a nutshell. If you truly keep these two commandments, you fulfilled all righteousness. Yeah, you fulfilled the law. Now, let me elaborate on this because I want to make sure that you understand it. All right? And I'm going to use the Ten Commandments as an example. Every one of the Ten Commandments can be categorized under one of these two categories. Each one either falls under the category of loving God or loving your neighbor. Let's look at the first four. The first commandment in the Ten Commandments is what? You shall have no other God before me. In other words, you don't worship any other God. Which category does that fall under? The category of loving God. If you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you will not worship any other God but God. Big G. Commandment number two. Thou shalt not make any graven image, if you got the King James Version. In other words, don't make any idols or serve or worship any idols. Which category does that fall under? Loving God. If you love God, you won't worship idols. Commandment number three. You're not to take the Lord's name in vain. If you love God, you will not take the Lord's name in vain. 
You will treat it with respect. You'll reveal it. You won't make any oaths or vows in the name of God. And if you do make it in the name of God, like marriage, it's a vow unto God. If you've ever heard my teaching on marriage, in my marriage vows, the vow I made was not to Lisa. The vow I made was to God in front of witnesses and what I would do in loving Lisa and being faithful to her. Yeah. The fourth commandment is to keep the Sabbath holy. It's not just keep the Sabbath, it's to keep the Sabbath holy. Holy means set apart. Set apart for who? God. That's why we go to church. We don't do it on the Sabbath. We do it on the Lord's Day, which is resurrection. Jesus was resurrected on a Sunday, the first day of the week. So we don't keep the Sabbath. We keep the Lord's Day. But Paul told us one person esteems one day over another. It doesn't really matter. It's what's in your heart. So Christians began to celebrate and keep the Sabbath on the Lord's Day. So the first four commandments fall under the category of loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. If you love God that way, you'll keep those four commandments. You don't keep those four commandments, I promise you, you don't have the love for God that he tells you to have. What about the next? What's the fifth commandment? Honor your parents. What does that fall under? Loving God? No. Loving your neighbor as yourself. When you become a parent, are you going to want your kids to honor you when you get old? doesn't say, now, children, technon, Ephesians 6 tells us, obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. But that says, children, technon. When you're underneath your parents' roof because you're not wise enough and mature enough to live on your own, you're to obey your parents. When you leave your parents and you cleave unto your wife, you create your own home, but you're still required to honor your parents. You won't necessarily have to obey them because you have your own family, but you are to always honor. If you love your neighbor as yourself, then that means you're going to honor your parents because you're going to want your kids to honor you. Thou shalt not kill or murder. Do you want anyone to murder you? Then love your neighbor as yourself. Don't kill anyone else. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't covet. Do you want those things to happen to you? Then don't do it unto others. Isn't it amazing that we can take the Ten Commandments and every one of them will fall under one of two categories? And it doesn't matter which law it is. It can even be the dietary laws. It's to remind you it's, it's actually an object lesson. You don't eat this because you don't allow anything unclean to come in. Why would you do that? Because you love God. And you don't want anything unclean to come in. Now, how do we view the law today? That's another sermon. I might touch on it. Who knows? I might go off on a tangent in a minute. <laughs> now, understanding that all the commandments hang on these two commandments is the key to understanding how Jesus could be made our sin and still remain sinless at the same time. And let me explain why. You see, in being made our sin, Jesus fulfilled the first and greatest commandment by submitting to God and obeying his will. He loved God so much he will, was willing to do whatever God wanted. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 through 7. I'll show you what I'm talking about. That is why when Christ came into the world, he said to God, this is Jesus speaking to God, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings. Why? Because they couldn't take away sin. They were a picture of what the Messiah would do, but they could never take away sin. And that's why you would continually, day after day, year after year, presenting these sacrifices over and over again. So he tells God, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you've given me a body to offer. The context means to offer as a sacrifice. You were not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. Then I said, look, I've come to do not my will, your will, O oh God. That's why when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, God, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. 
as it is written about me in the scriptures. In other words, God's will was for Jesus to make himself an offering for sin. And Jesus submitted to God's will and he obeyed him. Why? Because he loved God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. If that's what God wanted him to do, then he was more than willing to do it. People, that's love. And that's fulfilling the first and greatest commandment. It's keeping that commandment. If you love God, you'll keep his commandments and you will do his will. You'll obey his will. That's the first and greatest commandment. Now remember the second greatest, and it's likened to the first, is to love your neighbor as yourself. So, in being made our sin and dying for us, Jesus also fulfilled the second greatest commandment. How do you know that, Pastor? Well, In John chapter 15, verses 12 through 13, it says, Greater love has no man than this, that a man lays down his life for his friends. In other words, no man has greater love than to die for someone. Yeah. So in these essence, Jesus fulfilled all righteousness He kept this commandment by being made our sin and dying for us. In fact, if Jesus had not joined himself to us and died for our sins, he would not have fulfilled the second greatest commandment on which all the other commandments hang. Therefore, he would have ceased to be righteous. He would have been a lawbreaker because he would not have kept the second greatest commandment, which is one of the two on which all the other commandments hang. Had he not kept that? He would have been A, because if you keep all the commandments, but you don't keep one according to James, you are a what? Lawbreaker. Yeah. Why is that? Because if my neighbor's in trouble and there's something I can do to help them, and I don't do it, I've not kept, I've not fulfilled the second greatest commandment. People, we were in trouble. We were up the creek without a paddle. There's only one way to obtain eternal life, and we can't do it. But Jesus had the ability to help us. If only he would become our sin and die for us. So had he not helped us, he wouldn't have fulfilled us, or he wouldn't have kept the second greatest commandment, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. We are God's neighbor. So when Jesus was made our sin and he died for us, he actually kept, he actually fulfilled the two greatest commandments on which all the other laws hang. So he kept the law by fulfilling the two greatest commandments. So that's how Jesus was made our sin, yet remained sinless at the same time. He was made our sin, but he kept the law in doing so. So let me say it like this. Jesus never sinned, In becoming our sin, in fact, he actually fulfilled all righteousness by being made our sin. In fact, it's so important, I'm going to say it again, but I'm going to say it in a different way. Had Jesus refused to be made our sin and to pay the penalty for our sin, he would have broken the two greatest commandments on which all the other laws hang, and he would have been considered to be a lawbreaker. But he did refuse. He accepted and kept the two greatest commandments. So from a legal standpoint, God was able to raise Jesus from the dead. Remember, the law states in Leviticus 18.5, whoever keeps all of the law and never breaks the law shall live by it. In other words, have eternal life. So when Jesus died for us, he went to hell to pay for our sin And when all of our sin was paid for, God looked into hell and he saw a soul that had never sinned. In fact, he saw a man who had kept the law, who had fulfilled all righteousness. He had fulfilled the law by becoming our sin and dying for us. So according to the law, God could legally raise him from the dead because he was righteous. 